Hello everyone, welcome to Creatively Free. I'm your host, Ariel Grace, and I have the amazing pleasure of having my friend and someone I've known for a long time and been so inspired by join us today. So welcome, Karna. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you call yourself an alignment marketing strategist, and um, I'd just love you to introduce what that means to you. I would love to. I've been working in marketing, supporting women entrepreneurs and business owners space for, I was counting and it's going on 13 years. And uh, uh, this is really the culmination of what I've seen is what does the world need now in terms of how we're sharing our work in the world and the best way it started out as I first started with uh, feminine principles and marketing. And then I transcended the feminine and I realized for me, um, what needed to happen was us being in alignment with our soul, like with our soul gifts. And it's alignment with ourself, alignment with the divine as we define it, or with life itself, alignment with other, whoever you're in collaboration with, and alignment with the planet. So this kind of alignment marketing is applied to how do we share our work in a way that's actually in alignment with who we are in a creative way beyond all the pro marketing templates and these funnels and ideas that we've been fed, um, just like stuffed on our throat that m most <laughs> creative entrepreneurs or anyone that I work with do not feel drawn to or, or feel in alignment with, but they think it's their only choice. And I'm here to say that there is another way. <laughs> It's, it's so near and dear to my heart as well. Um, I know. And I actually have a marketing background too. And um, and that maybe gives you a different lens on it too, because you know about the psychology and like the power actually in design and marketing, both things, the psychology and the power to influence behavior, mm -hmm. how much a responsibility that is really. Yes. Uh, Huge. So, um. I'm curious, what are the ways that uh, you bring ethics to to marketing today in the in that huge bubble of non-ethical, scammy, <laughs> all the things? Well, you know, it's pretty simple. It's like golden rule: do unto others as you would like to have done unto you. <laughs> And we complicate it a lot and we know what doesn't feel good. And I say that use your body as an instrument for ethical behavior. It also has a lot to do with what we are optimizing for. So are we optimizing for, um, in marketing, a lot of times we're looking at KPIs, like we're looking at, we're optimizing for profit in this certain way, or we're optimizing for generating money or as many people as possible going into this funnel. So we're optimizing for numbers. It's a numbers game. So it's more around quantity. And so in my mind, it's all about going back to quality and really going back to what am I optimizing for? And I am very interested in consensual marketing. I think it's actually super satisfying for everyone involved because everybody feels a little slime. Like even if you want to buy something, but you have entered someone's funnel, and it's like, I really want this product. And then you have to go through the step after step of upsells, downsells, this or that, or timers or whatever it is that they're using. It ends up feeling like a little bit of a violation. And it's kind of like these micro violations and they add up <laughs> and it's not a way to build trust. And so it's all about that. I've been like this since I was a kid. So I'm just bringing like super basic human values back into the conversation like consent and kindness and transparency and truth telling and i mean you can go so far with just being you but you got to be re become really clear with what you're with yourself so it's a lot about for marketing it's about introspection too it's like what are you actually selling are you instead of going for pain points can you describe the I like some of the marketing things that we have, like transformation and this, like explaining to people, like, what's the transformation look like? It, what I heard you say is just 
don't don't kind of hook on to whatever everyone's saying and whatever everyone's doing and like just align like your you know what you do with people to what you know kind of like when you were a kid and how you would treat someone you know it's almost like yeah. you pile on all this education and tips and hacks and you know yeah. like try them out and then get lost in the flurry of all the options and yeah so for you as a photographer and what I call it in terms of branding, I call it essence branding. So really, if you can cultivate the essence of something, or in this case, we're talking, I'm speaking to like more of the solopreneur selling something of their own soul gifts. But even I think it could extend as far as into a product, like what's the essence of who really is benefiting from this? What's the essence of this product? If you can create an alignment from the essence all the way through, like a golden thread, like a thread throughout all the marketing and create like this consistency and this cohesiveness, it relaxes the nervous system and people are like, okay, I can, I feel, I know what I'm dealing with here from a uh, old school branding perspective would be you want recognition, but I actually think the brand is about creating co cohesion in the field, go into like the esoteric realm. It's very interesting. You're talking about calming people's nervous system with the brand. I love that. Well, the opposite is true. Like we're trying to, normally you're trying to like agitate their pain points with marketing, right? You're like, oh, what is keeping them up at night? And then like stab them right there. Right. And then you are the solution to that. And it's like, okay, but how fun is that? Yes, we can be coercive and make people do all sorts of things. But like, is that really the way forward? Like, is that really how we want to make our money? Hmm. I'm, I'm playing a lot. I'm playing a lot in the field. Like I'm being very, with my own marketing, with my, I, I'm just like in it with people. Like I'm not an expert. I haven't arrived anywhere. I have a shitload of strategies. I know that work so I can. I can be an ally helping people. I call it form and flow. When I create a marketing ecosystem, you want the structures there so that you can be playful because mm -hmm. otherwise it's chaos. Like if you have only flow and only creativity, it's very um, taxing to you as a business. Or like you can't really usually make money or get traction. So that's not good either. So there mm -hmm. is a delicate dance like within these. I personally have dedicated 50% of my life to is that how do, how do we grow businesses? How do we do this in this aligned ethical way? And the other side is me healing my own trauma and like being on my own creative path and renegotiating who I am in relation to patriarchy, all the systems, capitalism, late stage capitalism, all these like oppressive systems that I've been born into. I, I, I realized only after the age of 20, five or so, I've never had like a job, you know, a full time, like a 40 hour work week but I've actually been extremely creative with how I work. And I'm really getting curious about that because I thought it was kind of a stint. And then I was going to be like healed. And then I was going to be a big girl and like arrive and be able to teach something. And it's, it's not happening. I find that really interesting because, you know, everyone's talked about the gig economy and the tech bubble bursting and people losing jobs. I know so many people struggling right now have lost yeah. jobs and everyone's really curious about alternatives you know, it's real. It's really very much present, you know? Um, so I'd love to hear more, you know, whatever you'd like to share around um, entrepreneurial, creative, multi, you know, multi-channeled ways of, of living and earning. Yeah. What a big, what a big question. And what an important question. Like, I'm just really sitting with what, like, how painful it is to be forced into these transitions and like how, nice to be able to like go to a job and like have security and come something consistent and I'm gonna go like way out on the limb for a second okay sure all the way to I perceive uh what we're going through as a collective or like on the planet earth and also a lot in like the western world is that we had before COVID we had this ability to make believe that we were in control and that tags along with we had our jobs things were pretty certain and we were in this like really tiny like sliver of a time in the existence of humanity where things were like pretty good like pretty good like things are great like i'm slaying this i can just <laughs> like we could just be like and especially for me um i think it has like a timeline factor too because it's yeah 
I was in my 20s and now I'm 39. So I was like, yeah, anything's possible. All my friends weren't getting divorced and dying and kids and miscarriages and pandemics and all this. People who were a little bit further along, they were pretty stable. People who were like innovating in the space were pretty like able to do things. And it like appeared as if you could start a thing and it's fine, you know. And what ended up happening, I think, is we're getting in touch with some like non-negotiables about existence as human beings. Like we are not in control over the fact that we're going to be born. We're not in control of like what is going to happen to us while we're here, truly. And we're not in control of the fact that we're going to die. Yeah. And we're kind of, we've we just been sort of la, 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 you know, we don't have a good relationship with death. Hence, we don't have a good relationship with life. But we had sort of created these little systems that made us feel like sort of we got, you know, we're in control. We're, we're this is just my perception of what was going on. Uh, some people, of course, not. There was people who were marginalized, who were suffering constantly. But there were some folks, pretty privileged folks that felt like things were pretty stable and the pandemic and everything that has ensued in con in conjunction. Now people are suffering more. They're more depressed. They're that people are committing suicide. It's almost like turn up the knob, like everyone's latent trauma. All the things has to like come to the surface. Then there was that pan part of the pandemic where we were like, oh, this is going to pass and then it's going to go back to normal. And then we went out of that illusion. So we're kind of beat down from an existential perspective. And we have to dig really deep into resilience and start now being, what are we optimizing for? Plus <laughs> now with climate change and things changing and now with AI, yeah. we ain't going to have the ability to just suck the earth dry and create infinite energy forever and just power all these things in the way that we have to done in the past ai is taking jobs yeah but there's this like real churning so yeah. <laughs> that all being said my belief but it is to prove that we cannot do this on our own we have to look deeper into the fabric of existence and into the earth and like co-create back to some indigenous wisdom got to go backward to go forward look to indigenous wisdom and not in appropriation style. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about truly like engaging, looking at our own indigenous past. Like for me as a European, like I'm very, I'm working with this wisdom teacher named Ro Marlin, who's bringing a lot of awareness. So maybe you don't need to appropriate if you look at your own roots and what's in there. <laughs> and there's a lot in there. And then also um, to the divine and say, I can't do this on my own. Like something much bigger and wiser and kinder and more brilliant than I can ever imagine is working through me. And I need to hook into that somehow or I'm going down. Yeah. If you don't listen, it'll get louder anyway. <laughs> you know, everything we not, we're not going to hide from this. <laughs> so the, the whole premise was let, let's everybody work more and do more things and be more like have the status lifestyle, but that kind of disappeared. So the, there's just also a visitation of what's important to me, what matters here, what am I at, like on a bigger scale, scale, what am I doing? Like, I don't really, truly, we're getting to realize like, maybe we won't, maybe we're not so safe. Like, maybe I won't be here tomorrow. Then do I just want to have some job that optimizes for money and buying and consumerism? Or is this like, truly, who am I? What can only I do? Like, what are my things that only I can contribute that if I don't dig into here and, and excavate all this creativity and gifts inside of me, it will die and it will never be here ever again. Yeah. Legacy as your beingness. Because I believe that everybody has that within them. And there's a brilliant woman named Carol Sanford, and I'm reading her books right now uh, about re uh, regenerative life. And I really highly recommend her work. Because it talks about this a lot about in like in like organizational structure, but also like on a human level. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there's, and that's where creativity comes into the picture. Yeah. Because the creativity is on that unlocks all of that, all the things that were like stifled and pushed down. And like when we had to become adults and, and do all this stuff. So tell me more about that. How have you, you mentioned using Substack. Um, how are you? staying creative and doing things a little bit differently 
um, day by uh, Well, a concrete example is, I first of all, I, I chose to, one of the reasons why I chose to leave my business, the other business that I had, was a small marketing agency is because I had this hunch that I wanted to live on my own terms and I couldn't have a business partner that I had to like check with if things were okay. So I, I started to realize step one, this matters to me. This is really, really important to me, my creativity. And then I started looking at what, what do I actually want to do? So the things that came come to me that I wanted to dance, uh, I wanted to write and I wanted to sing. And I wanted to just be creating in every way I possibly could. Or And so there was a lot around self-permission. Mm-hmm. So I started to be more playful with how I dress and do my makeup and not really worry about how it's going to be perceived. Um, I started the sub stack and I, uh, I'm using the wisdom of my brother who is works in behavior design. So I took his certification training about habit coaching. So I learned everything I could about designing behavior, which I highly recommend everyone does because Literally, I feel so free because if ever I want to accomplish something, I know exactly how to design the behavior that leads to that. Mm. So for example, women are always optimizing for like cleaning the house or whatever. It's like, do the thing that you want to do first. I started, um, and then I was pretty uh, unapologetic to my partner, you know, my husband. I was like, I have to do this. I'm going to be a Zumba instructor. I'm taking this singing course. uh, And I'm... I'm starting this blog and then I just started and then I decided and I said to myself, I'm not doing this for anyone else but me. And as a woman and as like a good girl, conditioned good girl and like a kind of a saver personality that codependent to allow myself to do something for myself, like it was the biggest deal. Mm -hmm. And to do it first, like so when you wake up in the morning... And yeah. it's the weekend and um, you're like, yes. I best take out the dishes. Yeah. Instead, you have trained yourself with this behavior. Yeah. Training. So I gave myself, I had a system. Then it all goes to shit at some point. Like <laughs> it does. And that's okay. Because part of design and behavior is you're not doing it. You know, you're not doing it perfectly. This is my little hack. Okay. Is I have, because <laughs> my brother was like, here's how I optimize behavior. And I'm like, oh, good for you, man, who doesn't have periods and kids. And like, he was a single dude living on his own. Is like, oh, here's my one perfect week. I'm like, <laughs> meanwhile, like, he was living with me at the time. I had like postpartum with my second child and like, ah. Um, so I was like, there's this behavioral stuff. Like, this is not optimized for moms. So I devised this idea that... I could have three levels. So like if everything is going perfectly in my life, if I had all the things going well for me, this is how much I want to write. And then I had my like, ah, things are a little, mm -hmm." like here's my medium. It's like red, orange, green. And if I went green, everything's great. Like this is how much I write. I, you know, 30 minutes every morning, Monday through Friday. Shit starts getting whack. Like, I'm just, nah, that's my period. Like, I'm crying. It's like, okay, I'll do it Monday and Thursday. I'll write. And then, like, all hell broke, breaks loose. This is like when the kids are home puking. And it's like, okay, now I have, I just do this one little thing. Uh, I'll, I'll do a repost of an old thing just so I'm staying consistent in some way. Or I'm just doing this. And this was the hardest thing for me, too. It was allow my, it to be, like, small and shitty. I'll be like, I can't, you're just sending this email right now. No, but it's not perfect. (laughs) But it's not like I haven't gone through it with my OCD uh, control freak personality. So what if it happens? Oh, now we're doing typos. We're modeling imperfection. We're modeling humanity. Remember, like I would have to go back. Remember, we're doing this for ourselves. It was all the ways. And then they, and then just measuring like the joy and just like, optimizing for joy and being like what am I getting and instead of thinking oh who's opening nobody's opening it or people and I'll be like I love that part of myself that cares about how many people are opening I'm just like come sit with me and you know I do a lot of inner child work I'll be like or parts work both of those things and I'm like god it's so hard when you literally put your heart and soul and spent four days writing this and you to only two people liked it yeah. And I can, I really understand. And I, it's like, it totally, but you know what? 
I re- you're really a badass for doing this. Like yeah. I see you and I validate that. Be- that is good work. And like self validating your own stuff. Me like, yes. yes. And then I think, what if nobody ever likes it? I go there. I go worst case scenario. Nobody ever cares about my sub stack. It never gets any followers because I don't really share it anywhere. So it spirals into like, in order for this to be valuable, it needs to have some sort of bigger, more audience and this and that. And I think that that's true to a degree. Like I would want my art to have an impact on people. And then I'm like, but also like at the end of my life, if I, this is like a legacy of love, like this is me. Like, what if I can go back and read with my kids, my kids, they can read my whole life. They can maybe one person. I always write for one person or not. Yeah. One person. Like I wrote a piece. (laughs) It's you. (laughs) No. And then the thing is, we don't know how much we mean to people. This is what self-promotion does is that it's so contagious in the best kind of way. We have a digital presence and it actually outlives us. That's weird. That's weird. I know. And so to add to that interestingness is you're creating this thing that you, your soul is telling you to create. Awesome. You put it in the world and you kind of review it and you, at least I do this. And when I'm hearing you, I'm like, woo, I still love it. I love that thing I just created and it can create your own spiraling joy. Um, Yes. (laughs) Already great. And then, yeah, who knows after that? (laughs) We don't know, but we've been, we've been very conditioned to what we can and can't do for whom men and women in different ways, I would say. And there are certain things I notice that come up more for women typically. And I can't, and I would venture to say, I can't really say, say for other genders, but I'm assuming like there, it, like each, each expression has their own flavor of sort of conditioning and oppression. And I'm interested in all of it. You know, I am a feminist because of the equality factor. Like you could say humanist, but why I say feminist is because I think we have so far to go <laughs> in terms of gender equality. And why I'm so passionate about it is because I truly believe when I I, I engage with maybe different able bodies, people or different um, genders, just to get different perspectives or different cultures or whatever. Like I'm I'm trying to just stay malleable in that sense, because I believe in in an ecosystem approach to life and in the ecosystem, if you're going to be resilient, it's because you have have diversity. So I live in New Hampshire. It's not like the most diverse place on earth <laughs> so I have to like actively seek it and I really find that it it, it 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 enlivens my creativity so much and I listen to Luke uh, and they're a non-binary person who just talks about we're doing this for everyone you know like when we are free when we get to walk down the street like oh, just like flowing in the wind with the mascara and the glitter and the dress and just that everybody gets to win and same with feminism like when we liberate this creative genius with inside of women like it trickles and i i really feel right now i'm veering into a different area of this conversation but talk about how the masculine has been de- conditioned like they they live in such confined little boxes like I, at, at least women have way more space i feel like just go and look at the clothing store and see like what option like, here's the men's department like four colors we have we have been conditioned and robbed all all of us within a patriarch in all kinds of ways. There's nobody who got got, got through there unscathed as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. But I want, like, I want, I relish a world where men can just wear dresses and just, like, be more, you know, loving. It's just the oppression level is, like, so intense for all of us. Yeah. And that's why I find creativity is, like, my way out of there. It's like my little Ariadne thread out of the maze. Every little thing I create, it just empowers me more and more. Like you said, like enlivens me. And I like, I'm finding my way back to truth through, through this process. Yeah. The freedom side of it is huge and a sensitive topic, I think, to people um, because of global issues. I mean, it's, it's also our responsibility to 
like if we are free to feel and be as that in every way we can right um when I say responsibility it's not actually used to be heavy for me um but I don't mean it that way um as a word it's opportunity essentially yeah Yeah, I think there's a lot of word that has heaviness like has gotten a bad rep for instance like I was talking to someone about sacrifice the other day and I was like oh sacrifice no you know we don't need to I'm like that sacrifice is not a bad word Mm -hmm. it's actually an in you know that when you when you realize that it is a privilege and a responsibility, it, it, it heightens it, you know, it, it makes it more potent somehow. Like it just, so I, I, I hear you. I agree with you. I think it's a cool thing to do is to reclaim words in a certain way and alchemize them. Like you were just talking about, no, it's not a bad responsibility. I think if you're part of, of a, of a community you get, you give and you take, right? There's a giving and a taking and there's responsibility. You get, gain freedoms and you get, it's like a conversation between like freedom and safety. Being a way shower, right? You have to have examples of other people that make it safe to do whatever that thing is. Big time. And that's why I'm such a big advocate for the inner work because you need a lot of capacity in your being to be this free. Right? Yeah. I, I think with uh, go, circling back a little bit to business, whatever external things we want to see, I'm all about the inside out approach. We've been trained to do the outside in, look at all the metrics and look everywhere outside and then it inform us. And I'm just like, nope, we got to turn it on its head. And these are conversations that I've been in with many, many friends of mine. Like when I speak here today, like I think there's a Maya Angelou quote, you know, when I, I speak as one, but I come as 10,000. My friend, Timothy Joy is just coming out with a book called Extraordinary Wing Women. And I, I have been keenly listening, observing other women, just like, I'm like attuning to everyone all the time. I'm like, okay, I take from you. Okay. You, you just did that. Okay. Now I have more permission. Like, here's how I'm showing up inside of me. Like we're, we're all like in these, it's so cool to be part of these communities of, and I believe in the ripple effect of it, like these way showers, but we're all, I, I've had this visualization forever, this vision that I get when I like put on my warrior suit, but it's like also has fairy wings. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. <laughs> it makes, it's like, oh yeah, we're coming. <laughs> like, it's just like, what else? Oh, we have snacks. Like, it's just this playful, but warrior. So it's like, it's, but then I look and I, I always see, and I, I see the women awakening, like the next one and everybody wears different garb everybody looks different, like every different body shapes, different everything. And I'm just like, oh, yes, it's happening. You know, the divine feminine is like coming and all her, think about the domestication of women for, for millennia. And I just, it's like, there was a lot that got lost in these women's, in the creative lives of women that weren't getting expressed or even bastardized or taken by men or co-opted and, and still so is in my still. neighborhood and around the world. It's still there. Yeah. And it is. And so that's where this responsibility comes in. Well, if I have this freedom, I'm not squashing this opportunity. And some days I, I compare myself, Ariel. Okay. I feel like this path that I'm on, some, it's so not linear. It doesn't generate as much money as I would like to at times. The work is pretty unglamorous most of the time. So it doesn't have a lot of accolades in the external. Right. This is hard for me to talk about, but like I even see other women succeeding in these, using these tr- more traditional, like they go to a mastermind and then now I have six, seven figure blah, blah, blah. Oh. Mm-hmm. And it's like hard. Hey. Part of the creative journey is to be able to be able to be this free. I have to face horrifying stuff from my ancestry, mm-hmm. my the collective trauma that I'm processing through this, you know, as I'm doing it, my own childhood trauma. Like it's so much work sometimes. Of course. Yeah, you exactly. Know that every day. So this has been a humbling journey in the last few years. Mm-hmm. It's been extremely rewarding. The the amount of peace and joy that I have, I never thought. I'm pleasure. Mm-hmm. What is possible. I always wanted it. 
I love that though, because you're basically the choice between numbing out and feeling all the things, right? It's not just the joy. So true. Yeah. When I worked at Emerging Women, I this was the company that I worked for uh, nine years ago. I got to see like all the top women at the top of their game, you know? And I was like, I have that capacity, so I'm going to go for that. Because it, it again, I just, I saw the epitome. I thought like, that's what the, be- that's the top outcome. And this is uh, the last few years has been a renegotiation of, like, well, what is really my core values? And now I live the, like the joy that I get from leaves. Like, I'm a million. I am so rich right now. Like I was sitting in the leaves, like we did this whole leaf, but I'm like, look around. I'm like smelling the air. I'm just like, whoa. I need nothing. I actually want for absolutely nothing. Mm. But there's still this idea that I have that I should be bigger than that to be successful. I, I'm in it right now with that. You know, I have to admit it. Because yeah. I, I hope it will help other people to, to also feel like they're not alone. But I'm starting to get satisfied by sinking deeper into life versus reaching further out. So it's like a down and in versus in the, in the spiritual communities around ascension and so on. We cannot be ascending if we can't have an equal and opposite descent, or I don't know where we're going to be flying around somewhere. It ain't going to be great. <laughs> exactly. For sure. And that's what I love about the women that I hang out with. There's a real embodiment and there's a really sense of both and, and like you said, there's a chance of numbing out or it's like right now my heart feels like it's asked to hold the griefiest of the grief and this just just pure awe of mm-hmm. just the smallest aspects of existence and my children and then it's like both like just and that's why I named it my substack unfolding because I had this sense like if we tune into you know what the trick is, what I'm starting to realize, like the, the, the joke kind of, <laughs> and my pursuit of greatness. And uh, I'm just realizing Karna, there's a river of life that's flowing all the time. And you can actually just lay back in it. And if you just do what's yours to do each day and stay curious and stay in the process, it's really an organic life. We are not separate from nature. The way, same way an acorn can be planted in the ground and an oak tree grows and it doesn't have to do nothing. It doesn't right. have to aspire for more followers to become this oak tree. It actually just has to exist and, tr- and just be and mm-hmm. be enough. This is what I'm emulating and the internal, It's because I, <laughs> I have a pretty solid type A, a personality <laughs> and right now the joke is oh no this whole time you were actually not in control and you tricked yourself into that you were and there's something life is going to just happen to you and i it's almost like god is whispering to me you don't even know the beauty i have for you if you just stop and if you just know that you're enough and if you just stay curious and creative and be love love yourself and be love in action what would love do literally every moment and sometimes love is like no, block and delete sometimes, or, you know, I love you, but you're not safe to be around right now. So you're going to have to do, go play over there by yourself. Go in right. peace. And this is the conversation that I am with my relationship with the divine. Can I trust you that you got me? Mm. That I, yeah. And I think so. Like I'm actually starting to like learn. Hmm. I love the know. visual of the like laying back in the flowing river. <laughs> It just feels yeah, really- but things will always come in the river, That's right? Like, <laughs> and the, the more we stop and like check out of this, and you start observing, things keep happening, right? As it turns out, yeah. But this is, if we're going back to the essence brand, if we can find a way to just consistently show up in our essence and, and extend the invitation, basically saying, like, I'm here, I'm enough, who wants to play with me? Exactly. Magnificent things can happen. Magnificent things happen. So and good. I believe I, I, my, my hope and joy in my creative, like with my work that I'm doing, is that I will find a way to use social media that's regenerative. We're going to use the thing that is trying to take from us and we're going to outsmart it by 
using it in a way that empowers us and show up in a way where we're not have to pursue. What if I just go out in the world and be myself in, in most audacious way, whatever is your flavor. If you just really get curious about yourself and allow your flavor to take shape and be creative with this, your expression in the world, however it shows up, that's what I want to do with. That's what I do and what I aspire to do more. Nobody's going to have the same cookie cutter checklist. Go take my six step process. You know, I think that time is over and whoever's trying to sell that stuff still not going to work. Yeah. I love that. It's really inspiring. In truth. Um, I feel like you kind of like wrapped us all back, you know, into the beginning of this is it's not about the tactics it's about figuring out your essence by doing the work and, and visiting your inner child. That's definitely been part of mine is what does she want (laughs) that she used to love and wants to do a lot more. (laughs) That's what I was feeling from you. When I was engaging with anything from you, the energy that was coming through was so alive and playful and also like had grav- like some sort of, you know, it had that both end quality that I'm so very, very drawn to. So I, it really shows. Thank you. Uh-oh. Well, thank you so much for this amazing conversation and reconnecting with you. I'm so grateful. Thank you for having me so much. I loved it. I love, I'm just really grateful that you're giving me the opportunity to share what I'm so passionate about and like what I've dedicated my life to. So it's like, you're giving me like a huge gift right now. So thank you so much. Awesome.